To start off, I just, how many of you are really familiar with Duke Energy? Show of hands. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> However, I still think we need a scene setter because there were some there who didn't raise their hands. So I just wanted to spend a little time talking about what Duke does, what kind of utility you are, where the areas that you serve, that kind of stuff. Sure, and Alex, thank you, pleasure to be with you. So Duke Energy is one of the largest regulated electric and gas utilities in the US. We have a very large presence in the Southeast, uh, but we also serve the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and a gas business in Tennessee. Uh, because of our scale, we are leading the single largest clean energy transition in the US, given the scale of our transmission and distribution system and also the amount of generation that we own. So over the next decade, we will spend $145 billion, about 80 to 85% of it directed toward clean energy transition. So that, that's a lot of money. Like that's yes. some serious cash. And can you take me through the mix of kind of what you have now and then what you expect you're gonna be once you're able to deploy all of that money? Sure. Um, today, Duke is about um, probably a third nuclear, um, a third natural gas, and then the remainder is split between renewables and coal. We still operate some coal primarily in the Midwest. And as we look ahead, we will build five times the amount of renewables we have today by 2035. So 30,000 megawatts, 30,000 widgets of, uh, of power production. And we're also looking to add about 10,000 megawatts of battery storage, which mm -hmm. would be far beyond the total battery storage that is operating today in the U.S., just in the states in which we operate. Nuclear will continue to be a part of the equation, so we are the largest operator of regulated nuclear in the U.S., and we are working to sustain those plants for as long as we possibly can with um, a program called Second License Renewal uh, offered by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So that's the lay of the land, right? Like who Duke serves and what they use to serve that, uh, those customers, and it's a lot of money. So I just wanted to pivot to the newsy stuff of the day to see how you manage, say, First Republic may not make it. Uh, market cap below a billion dollars, stock down at record low again. Um, cost of capital is increasing with Fed raising rates. How do you manage that when you're also in this massive transition? Alex, it's a really good question because um, as confident I, as I am in the strategy and the targets we've set, at least 50% carbon reduction by 2030, 80% by 2040, there are external events, and there will continue to be external events that have the potential for us to check and adjust. I think about commodity prices. We just came out of an extraordinarily high commodity price environment. Natural gas is down, but that put pressure on price. Cost of capital is high. Supply chain constraints, everything from transformers to wire, and so you have to navigate all of these things. But in my mind, if you have a clear target of where you're going, then you're just checking and adjusting along the way to accommodate all of this. And these targets always have to be balanced with reliability and affordability. And so some of the things you're mentioning, Alex, are things we have to keep our eye on does to it, maintain affordability. Does it push stuff out for you guys? Does it change how you deploy the capital or how quickly you do it? Or is it just, like, how, how do you look at that holistically? It, it causes us to make choices, okay. there's no question. And in our mind, uh, direction of capital toward the clean energy transition is first. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you know, we may um, make some choices. You, I think you know, Alex, we've made a decision to exit our commercial renewables business. Mm -hmm. It's a choice uh, because we have an opportunity to sell that business and deploy that capital into the regulated space because I have so many demands. Right. So those are the types of things we'll continue to evaluate so we can keep going. But there's no question you're going to have to evaluate how these external factors are influencing the strategy. Uh, on a granular level, have you noticed investors more wary about deploying capital? Have you noticed banks being more wary to deploy capital? I would say the uh, focus on balance sheet is very high right mm -hmm. now in our industry. And uh, if you think about coming out of a high commodity price environment and operating in a high interest rate environment, that puts pressure on the balance sheet. A utility is very leveraged. So think of us as being 50% debt, 50% equity. And so the agencies are watching. Yep. Uh, how quickly are you responding and how can you maintain that balance sheet strength? Are you noticing any signs of recession in the US from your customers? Have you noticed 
Yeah, we'll start there. There's a lot of caution, I would say, mm -hmm. Alex, but I don't have tangible statistics yet. Right. We continue to see a lot of in-migration into the southeast. We continue to see extraordinary success in economic development, mm -hmm. uh, really around electric vehicles, batteries, chips, you know, those types of things. But as I talk to industrial customers, there's also um, some caution. What does all this mean? Um, continue to see labor shortages. Supply chain continues to be an issue in certain industries. And so I do think everyone's watching and a little bit concerned, but we haven't yet seen the data indicate a slowdown. We have seen that throughout the earnings calls too. Um, inflationary pressures. As you spend all this money over the next 10 years, as a boatload of money in, in DC waiting to be deployed, does that increase prices for Duke across the board? Like, are we gonna be living in a higher price, higher inflationary environment? It feels that way right now. Um, but one of the things I think about with the clean energy transition, because we are you know, moving so rapidly in renewables, moving so rapidly into battery technology, I do not believe the supply chains have yet caught up with the aspirations. And that creates a little mm -hmm. bit of inflationary pressure. Uh, but I think as we build the supply chain to go with where we're going, I'm hoping we can execute more longer term transactions. When you execute a longer term transaction, you create some certainty for the vendor and hopefully some more favorable pricing. So we're looking actively at how we can accomplish that. Like that's a little Lynn good speak for yes, but not forever. <laughs> we're right between the lines here. Um, so l let's talk about that transition. Um, how do we do it? keeping everything reliable and making it affordable for everyone. And I say that glibly, and it seems like maybe it's an obvious question, but it's actually not. And there's a lot of money to be deployed and there's a lot of things that can go wrong. How do you guys think about it when you're talking about it? For us, um, developing realistic targets mm -hmm. on where we need to be by when so that we can plan for it, so we can make least cost choices so we can contract a supply chain that's gonna be available when we need it. All of those are ingredients into making sure affordability goes along. And then a lot of work on reliability every day. Um, this is an operating issue for us. Mm -hmm. Our customers count on 24 seven every season power. And so when we unplug something and plug something else in, they have to work seamlessly. No one is waiting for us to have no power on the weekend so we can transition you know, from one generation source to another. So it starts with modeling. It starts with observing operating characteristics. Mm -hmm. It starts with piloting and figuring out how do we go forward. Um, but I appreciate your recognition, Alex, that we cannot do any one of these things alone. Right. We have to transition. We have to maintain reliability. We have to maintain affordability. Um, and also, that's not to count the fact that climate change also changes the sun and the weather and like how a wind farm can operate. I mean, that's yes. a whole different part. There's a transition and there's like, will my stuff be operational if there's a massive storm? Yes. Um, how do you deal with that part of the reliability conversation? So we live in the hurricane zone. Yeah. We know a lot about hurricanes. Um, and you know, it's interesting, the, uh, the operation that we want around hurricanes begins you know, in January of every year. So we're ready when hurricane season arrives. So we have the equipment that we have identified relationships with contractors and other suppliers, uh, that we have our military operation to house and feed linemen from all over the U.S. when it's time to go. And we also keep records. Where is that water likely to be? Where are we likely to see flooding so that we make investments to minimize impact to the extent mm -hmm. we start to see trends from the way you know, the weather is behaving. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in my tenure, we've probably had 10 or 12 hurricanes. So it is a frequent event and it's run like a military operation, and I'm really proud of the work we do. Our customers count on us, and we are uh, there to deliver. I've definitely seen their command center. It definitely is, is, is pretty cool. Uh, lots of technology for it. Um, so Lynn, to that, and this is the reliability factor, nuclear and natural gas. So we talk a lot about wind and solar, there's obviously the reliability problem, and the storage problem, and, and you're a firm believer in natural gas and nuclear still going forward. I am. Why? So nuclear for us, is essential. I cannot meet any target without nuclear because I start from a place where 80% of my carbon-free generation today comes from nuclear. If you are a resident of North and South Carolina, 50% of your power comes from nuclear. I cannot retire those plants and replace them with something that runs 95% of the time that is carbon-free. So in my mind, those plants need to continue 
We're working actively to secure a second license. But we're also active in small modular reactors and advanced nuclear. Are those still really expensive, though? And they're not yet to commercial scale. Right, so we're um, not there yet, but that's something that you'd want to be looking absolutely. at. Absolutely. And I, I think about the decade of the 2020s, and you see this in the infrastructure bill, a lot of work to do, research and development, investment, piloting, trying, getting the operations of these technologies ready to go. So when we need them in the 2030s, my hope and expectation is that they'll be there. Uh, natural gas is part of the diverse portfolio. It serves a really important role today in a comparable way with renewables. So you have a solar and battery uh, combination, but there's still more time during the day when power needs to be delivered. And natural gas not only has the ability to move as our customers use power, but it also has the opportunity to supply power when that renewable isn't there. So I think it will play an important role. We are spending a lot of time on R&D there as well. How can hydrogen work? How can carbon capture be a part of it? And we're also um, very clear on expectations around methane, setting clear targets so we responsibly use natural gas in a way that lowers environmental footprint. Before audio freaks out, I'm just going to move your scarf a little bit. OK. All right. There we go. <laughs> um, I was like, what is the that fashion? feedback? There we go. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. OK, so based on that, um, the other question becomes permitting, and this goes into natural gas, like you have to get it from one place to one place, you have to wind up managing uh, nuclear, and if you're going to do small modular reactors, you need to put shovel in the ground somewhere. You, you, you've definitely been traumatized by permitting. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know if all of you are familiar, it was a colonial, right? Was that, yes. Yeah, it was a colonial pipeline, Atlantic Coast pipeline that they had to scrap. It was going to be a billion dollars, 4.5 billion. The cost went up to eight, and then eventually you and uh, Dominion walked away because it just couldn't get it done. How do you feel about permitting right now? Permitting is a challenge. Yeah. What would fix and, it? You know, in the case of the pipelines, it was litigation challenge. So every yeah. permit that was secured went to the courts, and it just creates delay. Was it state or was it federal? Uh, both permits were challenged. Both types okay. of permits were challenged. So what I would say about permitting is I think we all need to recognize there is a way to build infrastructure involving stakeholders, uh, involving communities, and doing so in an environmentally, environmentally responsible way. I believe all of that. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about permitting reform, I'm not talking about walking away from any of that. But I do think we need to recognize that some streamlining of this process is going to be important so that we can build the infrastructure necessary to achieve our objectives. And when you talk about some of those experiences, Alex, the permitting took far longer than it would have ever taken to build these things, and in wow. some cases, stopped the projects entirely. And so I, I think, I, I know it's a politically charged um, discussion, but I believe there are some achievable things we can do to streamline federal and state working together, federal agencies working together, and of course, always paying attention to communities, stakeholders, and the environment. Mm -hmm. But let's figure out how to build some things. Uh, we will never achieve this clean energy transition if we cannot figure out how to build the infrastructure. I love that. Let's just build some things. I, let's do yes, yes. Did, did you feel like the conversation is changing? Do you feel like there is more appreciation for the fact that we have to put shovels in the ground, that we have to seriously consider new types of nuclear reactors or not? I feel like the conversation is there, Alex. Okay. I think in nuclear in particular, the conversation has changed dramatically over the last five years. Um, but when it comes right down to it, we have to be able to work together with our federal and state agencies and secure permits. Yeah. And uh, we have to sustain those permits to the point of construction, and we have to get some things in service. So I'm optimistic, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, McCarthy, the House Speaker, uh, is trying to pass his own debt ceiling plan, and part of that is going to be rolling back some of the subsidies um, from the IRA for green energy, et cetera. Do you feel like the train has left the station and that you're going to keep going on this plan no matter what comes from D.C., or do you feel like if all of a sudden we do repeal some of it that investment stops, that um, uh, technology stops? I think there are a couple of things I would say there. Alex, because we operate in a very, you know, political environment, both mm -hmm. at the state and federal level, houses change every two years, senates, some places four, some places six. What we uh, focus on at Duke Energy is where do we believe we should go? 
okay. for our customers, for our company, for the sustainability of our investments? And then how do we navigate through changing political waters? And I believe our commitment around carbon is an unchanged commitment, but it may be a check and adjust depending on mm -hmm. how public policy either supports those efforts or is an obstacle. Mm -hmm. The Inflation Reduction Act for Duke Energy's customers is a way to reduce price. And so we were supporters of those tax incentives because because of our business model, every dollar goes right to my customers. So it does lower the price of the clean energy transition. I think it will have an economic impact to get mm -hmm. infrastructure built. Uh, but trying to find a way to keep going in all political seasons, working with both sides of the aisle, bipartisan if we can, is always our objective at Duke. How do you think about energy poverty? Um, we talk a lot about reliability and affordability and then green. How do those three interact? They have to be balanced. And I think if you appreciate that a, a utility, um, I serve everyone. I don't have a choice on who to serve. Anyone who sort of lives in my territory, I serve. So you can picture the demographics of what that might be. Uh, from low income senior citizens, I also have manufacturers that are trying to compete um, against you know, overseas companies. So affordability across the board is important. And we learned uh, you know, a lot during the pandemic because it was not only a health crisis, but an economic crisis for many people. And I shared with Alex a moment ago, we put together what we called an agency team, a team of employees at Duke whose job is to figure out how to help vulnerable customers with their bills. Because there are federal dollars or state dollars or social service organizations, available safety net organizations, but often they're so difficult to navigate. Uh, that over that two-year pe period, we were able to connect $300 million with our vulnerable customers. And I think that's going to be critical as we pursue this transition. It's another lens on affordability uh, that we have, you know, citizens, customers that struggle, and we have to figure out how to keep the lights on for them so that they can take care of their families. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It's, it's a lot of money. million. Really proud that's of it. a lot. And, yes. and that's before... We're moving into solar and wind and more We're out at the of beginning. coal. Like, this is the beginning of that it's transition. Yes. Um, we only have, like, 40 seconds left. So I just want to get your take. When we talk about the energy transition, which I know will be like, the topic du jour, is that the right word that we should be using, energy transition? What's the word you guys use? We use clean do? energy transition. You do use transition. Okay. Clean energy transition. Um, because that encompasses nuclear, it encompasses renewables, it encompasses battery storage energy efficiency, demand response, electric vehicles. Um, and those are the technologies we're going to be put to, putting together over the next many decades. Will we ever be without natural gas, like with fossil fuels? You know, Alex, we look at our system every hour of the day, you know, yeah. into the 2030s, into the 2040s. Um, I think about natural gas as being important until we can find a carbon-free technology that operates like natural gas that follows load, that ramps up and down. And when we find that, we'll be in, uh, we'll be in a transition into a new technology. What a great way to end. Um, thank you so much, thank Lynn. You, it was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you.